This morning we're in Daniel, once again, chapter 5, if you have a Bible, go there with me. And just as a quick recap, the first four chapters deal with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he has a 43-year reign as the king of Babylon, the whole empire, really, of the known world. In chapter 5, where we are today, it jumps ahead about 23 years after Nebuchadnezzar's death. It's the final night here in chapter 5. It's the final night of the Babylonian empire, and now it's under Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. Daniel is now advanced in years. He's somewhere in his mid to late 80s. If you know the story, he came into Babylon around 15 or 16 years old. And the book of Daniel doesn't so much concentrate on chronology as it concentrates on reminding the Jewish people and you and I of God's sovereignty, of God's rule, and his authority over man's history and man's future. In, in chapter 5, we see the, the pride and the arrogance of King Belshazzar. And today, I think we live in a world of great arrogance and pride Men so proud of their, their accomplishments and their wisdom and their ability, kind of, as a, even as a nation, we've thrown God to the side because we're, we're able to, you know, control everything now. Well, Belshazzar, <laughs> we can't even control our own car horns. <laughs> Be Belshazzar, the king the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Let's start with verse 1. Chapter 5. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. So here he is, Belshazzar. He's throwing this huge party. And it's interesting. He's got a thousand of his sort of leaders, his, his lords, and it says, while he tasted the wine, verse 2, Belshazzar gave the command. It's interesting. Belshazzar, the great king, made a great feast for thousands of his lords and drank wine in the presence of a thousand. And when he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives and concubines might drink from them. When it refers to Belshazzar's father, it's really his grandfather. You never see in scripture the word grandfather or great grandfather. It's kind of like they always just use the term singular father, like Abraham, the father. Uh, it, it's, it's just written that way. And when Nebuchadnezzar died, and here's kind of the way Belshazzar got there. His only son succeeded him, Nebuchadnezzar's, and he was murdered by Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law, who had married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. He was succeeded, this son-in-law, by his son, who also was murdered by another one of Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-laws. And this king loved to travel. He was sort of an adventurer. And so as he's traveling around the empire, he, he puts his son Belshazzar in his place in the region of Babylon. So here you have this family. Looks like a great, happy, royal family, doesn't it? Murdering one another and uh, all scheming against one another. And, and Babylon, the great nation, lasted about 70 years. So Belshazzar now ruling in his father's stead, got a thousand of his lords there gathered in the palace, and there's this crazy party going on there, drinking and partying pretty hard, 
And the interesting thing about it is while they're doing this, there's a siege on the city. The Medes and the Persians are outside the gates. In fact, the rest of the empire has already been defeated. This is the last standing major, uh, if you would, stronghold for Babylon. And these Persians and the Medes have come to conquer the rest of the empire. And, and, and this is the city of Babylon itself. So it's kind of odd timing to have a drunken party. But it's an expression. Listen, it's an example of the king's pride, of his arrogance. He felt that the great city of Babylon was undefeatable, that it was inconquerable, had giant walls, two of them super wide, super high, towers everywhere for marksmen to be set, and a food supply that would last over 20 years if they couldn't get outside the walls. So they feel prepared, they feel protected. Uh, the river Euphrates ran through the city. They had plenty of water to drink. And many believe that he was probably having this party to, to call upon his gods, to, to celebrate them, to honor his gods, to get their help and their protection. So, so not only during a time of being attacked is he having a party, and they're all getting drunk and I think feeling the effects of the wine. Well, he, he commands to bring the gold and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar, verse 2, had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords and his wife and his concubines might, it says, drink from them. Now, now let me have your attention. It's not like they're out of cups. Hey, we're out of cups. You got, why don't you go get those one... No, no, this is, this is something he's doing of, of arrogance and disrespect to the God of the Jews. It's kind of poking the bear, so to speak. And he, he's just full of himself, and he's making offense to a foreign God to disregard the God of Israel while he is, is celebrating his own false gods. And these are still God's holy instruments, designed and fashioned for the tabernacle and the temple. And it's not like God doesn't see this, right? It's a picture how people can do amazingly dumb things, especially under the influence of alcohol. They're all drunk, and they're having a great time. The city is being sieged by the Medes and the Persians. And he, he, he just goes another step further. And alcohol causes a lot of things in people's lives. It lowers your inhibitions and restraint, gives a foolish sense of bravado. You always see, I, I never did hang out in bars, but I had friends who did. And I had one good friend from high school who seemed to always get into a fight whenever he went into a bar. And I think maybe you've experienced this. A little drinking. <laughs> It's crazy what happens. So, so there they are. Hey, bring in the gold goblets from the temple. Let's, let's have a party. And, and, and this is going down. And then they brought them. The gold vessels that had been taken from the temple, verse 3, of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines began to drink from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. They're using the holy God of Israel's instruments to praise false gods. And it says in the same hour, verse 5, the fingers of a hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. All of a sudden, not a body, not a figure, but just a hand lit, lit by the light that's there on the sides of the walls, these, these torches, these lampstands, and a finger begins to write on the wall. How many of you think that got everybody's attention? <laughs> and the king sees it. And, and notice what happens here. 
to Mr. Party Man, Mr. Bear Poker. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, verse 6, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. His countenance changed. He goes white in his face. His mind is racing out of control. It's all kind of an involuntary response. The joints of his hip are loosened. He's kind of doing an Elvis thing all of a sudden. And he's, he's, he's just freaking out. His knees are knocking. This is a massive, sobering, buzz-killing event for the party. And he goes from king of the party, center of attention, getting, giving orders and, and, and throwing this huge bash, drinking alcohol, now terrified all of a sudden. Knees are knocking, wobbling, white in the face, and all he has seen is a hand sent by God, a message. Imagine if, if a hand can cause this mighty king to respond in fear and shaking and scared and uh, turning white. What will it be like for those who one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ? I mean, what's that going to be like when, when they rejected the Lord whom they heard of and, and shunned his, his love and his righteousness? You know, there's a, there's a passage of scripture. I'll, I'll just read it to you. It's pretty sobering from the book of Revelation of those who one day will stand before the judgment seat. It says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them to hide. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his own works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And every one, and anyone, not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Can you imagine? Standing there before God, and he says, yeah, I've got your whole life written out here. And what you did with my son. And what you did with your actions. And these are not my words. These are the words of the Bible. Savior or judge is who he'll be one day when we stand before him. Those are, those are the words of scripture. Can you imagine at that time there'll be no arrogance. There'll be no pride. There'll be no more defiance. As you look around at our culture today, there seems to be no reverence or fear of God. But in that day, there will be. And, and there's this, this scenario going on here right now in Daniel chapter 5. And it says, then the king's countenance, verse 6, changed. His thoughts troubled him. Joints of his hips were loosened. His knees knocked against the other. And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers. Hey, we need to figure this out. Bring in the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. Because, well, Belshazzar's father was first. He was second. And he's going to make whoever can give him the interpretation third in charge. He has no idea that it's all over. The purple, the gold chain, the third of the kingdom, there'll be, there'll be nothing left here in a few moments. Now, the writing is actually Aramaic, and they could all read it. What he wants to know, what is the message behind these words? And in verse 8, now all the king's wise men came but they couldn't read the writing. It basically means they, they, they couldn't interpret it. Couldn't make known the interpretation to the king. None of them, standing there, all his 
wise men, all his great soothsayers. And then King Belshazzar, verse 9, was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. He, he's even more freaked out than he was before. And his face continues to contort, and all his royal party with him, and, and the whole festive mood party has come to a screeching halt. And the word has spread throughout the palace. And the queen, verse 10, this would be Nebuchadnezzar's wife. Uh, this would be Belshazzar's grandmother. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet. And the queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Long live the king. Do not let your thoughts trouble you. Don't, don't let your countenance change. She, she steps into the scene. She's heard what's going on. She shows up, and it says, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Quite a reputation. Quite a description given by the queen, by this grandmother. Now, she may have never told Daniel that. But this is how she saw him, how she understood him. Daniel's life had spoken loudly to her. And for some reason, it seems like Belshazzar never paid attention to who he was. He's not even invited to the party. He's not even called at the beginning. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, verse 13. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, who my father, the king, brought from Judah? He reminds Daniel, you're a slave. You're a captive. Kind of, if you will, uh, putting Daniel in his place compared to him. He's not at the party, doesn't seem to ever be known by Belshazzar. But, but Daniel is, is still sharp, he's still ready, he's still in touch with the Lord. And it just shows you the, the arrogance once again of this king as he speaks to Daniel this way. Oh, oh I've heard, he says, of you that the spirit of God is in you and that the light of understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. My grandma just told me about you, but that's back then. And he's kind of sizing Daniel up. Now the wise men, verse 15, the astrologers have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I've heard of you, that you can. You give interpretations, you explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel, I'm going to make you the same offer. The idea here seems to be that he can buy whatever he needs, that everyone has a price. And Belshazzar has wealth, he has power, and he thinks, I can buy your spiritual gift. I can buy your interpretation. How much do you need? He wants to buy God's wisdom. He wants to buy God's power. He wants to buy God's significance and richness. How about some gold, a uh, nice gold chain, some purple, some real estate? See, here's the thing. Well, there we go. There's horns, there's mics. Here's the thing, Daniel has the true source of riches. 
He's got all the wisdom that God's given him. God's elevated him. God's used him. He's got God's peace. He's got God's favor. He's got God's uh, hand on his life, a relationship with the one true God, and the Spirit of God speaks through him. And here's the thing. You can't buy those things. He'd like to buy them. Belshazzar's offering him a lot. He has nothing, and Daniel has everything. Here's this great Lord shaking and trembling and face gone white. And please listen to this. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. As you live a few years, you realize Belshazzar and anyone else who judges a person by their wealth or by their stuff or by their position has a very poor understanding of life and people and what true character and significance is all about. Here's this great king. He, he, he has everything. But I would submit to you, Daniel is far richer in so many ways than Belshazzar ever dreamed to be. I mean, I, I think Daniel's probably standing there thinking, who needs a gold chain? Who needs a purple robe? He, he was given more than, than, than Belshazzar was ever given. He's not looking for a gold chain, a convertible, and a young wife. He's doing okay. And so in kind of a humble way, Daniel answers in verse 17. He says, just let your gifts be for yourself. Keep your stuff. It's, and he's not being arrogant or rude here. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known him the interpretation. Here's Daniel's response. He doesn't want this king to think he can buy God's favor or his wisdom. God's not after his money. Daniel doesn't want this to be a transaction, a donation to his ministry. You, Daniel's not saying, well, if you'll, if you'll plant your gold seed and your purple seed and your, into my ministry, oh, God will bless you. No, Belshazzar, here's what this is about. It's about you. And it's about God. So, so Daniel's going to tell him a little bit about history. O king, verse 18, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom. And it was majesty, glory, and honor. It was the first world power known to man. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished he executed, whomever he wished he kept alive, whomever he wished he set up, and whomever he wished he put down. More than the interpretation, he, he wants to, to, to show Belshazzar a little bit of history related to what he should have learned from his grandfather. But he chose to overlook. He said, this, this kingdom that, that you're ruling over, it was given by God. And because of his majesty, God gave him peoples, verse 19, nations and languages. They, they trembled and feared him. And he says, but when his heart was lifted up, verse 20, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And, and we know, we saw, we saw last week, though, the end of the story of Belshazzar. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar. It, it, we, we saw last week when he finally came to himself that, that God exalted him and, and he, 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 he exalted the Lord. In verse 22 and 23, of, of, our, of our chapter here, it says, But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. You, you, you chose to forget it. You, you lifted yourself up, and you've lifted yourself up, verse 23, against the Lord of heaven. 
They have brought the vessels of his house before you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you've praised gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your very breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Let's listen to what he says. God holds your very breath in his hands, Belshazzar. And you know the history of your grandfather, and yet you chose to disregard it. And what is true of Belshazzar is true of everyone in this room, everyone in this planet. He holds your very breath in his hands. He knows your lifespan. We, we live at his pleasure. You know, I'll never forget a, a knock on my door one time. Valentine's Day 2011. The message to me was from one of my nieces. Hey, your, your, your brother died. What? Yeah, Yancey passed away. When? And, and, and all of a sudden, he was gone. Nothing I could do about it. Nothing anybody could do about it. it, it and, and when our time is up, Daniel puts it in such clear, he says, God holds your breath in his very hand. Daniel confronted the king's pride. Now at this time, listen, I think there's a lot of tension in that room, don't you? Belshazzar, I don't need your gold. I don't need your purple. I don't need your kingdom. Let me tell you what you've disregarded. You've disregarded your history of your grandfather. You, 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 you've, you've taken the holy instruments of the God of the universe and you've, you've discredited them and you've abused them. And then he goes on. Then the finger of the hand were sent from him and his writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Okay, I'll give you the interpretation. Now, I'll tell you what this says. This is sent from the God, he says, that, that you never bothered to learn about or seek out, or even though it's part of the heritage of your family. You, you didn't pay attention to it. Then the finger of the hand was sent from him, and this writing was written. And... I don't think Belshazzar ever looked into his grandfather's history. If he did, he disregarded it. And, and maybe you're here today, and you've been brought up in a Christian family. Godly parents or godly grandparents. And you've walked away or, or, or turned your back on God. And you live a life that's, that's just maybe, oh, go to church on Sunday, but that's about it. Far away from God. See, I, I grew up a family that never went to church. We, we didn't go to church on Sunday. We didn't have devotions. There was no such thing as our family sitting down together on a, on a Monday morning or Tuesday and, and, and the Bible being opened and or praying at meals. It never happened in our family as I grew up. No one ever talked about, hey, finding God's will for your life. I would have loved to have had a godly mom and dad that prayed in the morning, that was concerned about me finding God's will for my life, or a father that would say, hey, let me pray with you about this decision. Daniel's saying to Belshazzar, you, you walked away from this. And if you remember the, the, the final part of, of, of chapter 4, when, when his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, he says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven of whose works are truth and his ways justice and those who walk in pride he's able to put down. Those were the last words we heard from Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. But he's walked away from it. He scorned it. And so he begins to remind him of the heritage that he had. And then he gives him this inscription, meanie, meanie, tekel you farson. 
This is the interpretation of each word. Mini means numbered. God has numbered your kingdom. And it's finished. Tekel. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In other words, he says, you've been weighed and you're a lightweight. You are going down. It's God's glory, God's will, not yours. It's over, it's done. Divided actually means torn apart, smashed, wiped out. And then Belshazzar, verse 29, gave the command. Hey, put purple on him. Put a gold chain around his neck and make a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. He st still did what he wanted to do. And that very night, verse 30, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. The kingdom had come to an end, just as God had revealed. The enemy, the army, if you know the story, the Euphrates River ran under the wall and, and provided water for the whole city. They, they created some kind of diversion and, and caused the water to divert another direction. And they were able to come under the walls, the Medes and the Persians, and su completely surprised Belshazzar and all his great army, and they were easily defeated. And, and so as we finish up the, the, the end of the great Babylonian empire, one great application or lesson that, that in these first five chapters, no matter how great your power or your pride or your status or your wealth, the one true God rules and oversees it all. Amen. You remember, remember that old song? I, I had, we had some, some of our grandkids over yesterday. You, you probably have this little tool too, Alexis. Play so and so. Well, they like to, this, uh, this little two year old girl loves to play songs. And, and then she likes to dance. So we're dancing. And I say, Alexis, play. You got the whole wide world in your hand. Remember that song? And it comes on. You got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. And we're dancing. You got the. Brothers and the sisters in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. He's got the little bitty babies in his hand. I could go on. <laughs> but, but this is what was told to Belshazzar. Belshazzar, he doesn't need your gold. He doesn't need your purple. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the very breath of every person in his hands. He controls history and future. What God says come to pass, immediately it came to pass for Belshazzar. And I would submit to you, that is true of every promise in this book. They all come true. And we all have to deal with our pride we all stand at the cross at the same level, sinners who need forgiveness, no matter what our status might be in the eyes of men or women. There's a, there's a passage, passage I wanted to read from Galatians chapter 6. It says, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And that's a great passage because no one else is deceived. They see you for who you really are. You just deceived yourself. Not fooling anyone else. If I view myself as greater than others, then I have to always prove it. And that's a high maintenance life. See, see, listen, we'll close with this. If you're living a life where you're disrespecting others, mistreating them or looking down on them, whoever it is, maybe even in your marriage, are your children, are your parents, are an employee, are an employer. Maybe you don't know the Lord. 
but reminded of this. He holds your very breath in his hands. And there's no one in his eyes, you know, that, well, that one, yeah, he's got a gold chain, a purple shirt on, and lots of real estate. He, whoa. God's like, no. He, he's made a promise that, that if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Belshazzar. And his drunken arrogance, parting with a thousand people in his palace. Suddenly, everything changes. And he says, tonight, it'll all be taken from you. What, what an amazing, sobering story it is. To have forgotten his past and what God had revealed to his grandfather. To, to have walked away from all that revelation and all that knowledge. To not even have known really the story of Daniel. His grandmother and Daniel himself had to bring it to his remembrance. Let's not walk away from those things that God has spoken to us in the past and showed us of himself and revealed to us who he is. Because all of us in this room, all of us on this planet, even if we don't know it, even if we don't realize it, God holds our very breath in his hands. And we all stand before him one day. We all face him as either judge or savior. You know, I want to face him as my savior. And I'd like to hear a few words of, John, you did okay. A little, maybe even a little, throw a little well done in there. I'd love to hear that, wouldn't you? I don't think... Belshazzar heard that, but my hope, my prayer is that you and I might stand before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings one day, not as a judge, but as a merciful, gracious Savior who's washed away all our sins by His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.